Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Donna Mitchell with Pivoting to Web3 Podcast. And I have today a special, special guest. As soon as I saw him and met him, he made me smile with his introduction. He's got a fabulous show. His name is Jake Tullis. Jake, who knows all things, I think, Tullis. But I'm not going to introduce him. I'm going to let him introduce my introduce himself, you know, on the on the podcast. So Jake, take it away because you are a treasure and I know you have a lot of gems to share. So tell us what you do, how you do it, and how did you get into the Web3 crypto space? Well, one, thank you, Donna, for those kind words. You were you're just too kind to me for no reason. And I appreciate that so much. Um, I am Jake Tullis. Uh, I go by JT. My handle is JT Knows Things. Basically, I do a lot of research in crypto and I document the uh, results of that research. I'm doing that research because I have a hedge fund. We are called Bleeding Edge Capital. I am raising millions of dollars and managing millions in the market. Um, We are discretionarily long. That means I look very, I'm talking holding assets 20, 30 years. I look very far out using basic principles, and I'm sure we'll get into all that in this episode. So that is me. Yes, we will. And basically, what I'd like to know, when you got into crypto, how did you decide it's something that you wanted to do and get involved with beyond being a hedge fund manager? How did you know to pay attention to it? Maybe that's the question. I had an awful experience at a bank, a terrible experience at a bank. I I had a, a, a unique experience in college. I had a software development company. It was called Elosophy or Electronic Philosophy. And it was doing really well. And I had some money that I needed to move to Islamabad, Pakistan for some people I was going to hire for a job. And I got held in the bank for over an hour. And I don't want to mention banks or anything, but I got I got held in that bank until someone from the FBI field office 50 minutes away would get there and talk to me about what I was doing with the amount of money I was moving and where I was moving it to as a 19-year-old kid. It was suspicious. They thought I was a sell, and they just didn't believe I had a business and all this other stuff. It was pretty crazy. So after that moment, I was like, I do not want anything to do. I became a libertarian that day, almost an anarchist, mm-hmm. and it put me down a crazy path. Uh, and I And I heard a ripple. Right. I heard of frictionless cross border payments because I just experienced a lot of friction uh, in an institution. Up until that point, I trusted banks. I didn't think anything of banks. I wouldn't question their place in society or their role they have in, in the function of currency if it weren't for that experience. So that's trauma. <laughs> Usually trauma builds, right? It sets us mm-hmm. up. It can set us up for success, you know, our finding our life's purpose and passion there. But, you know, yeah, that event was really, really bad. Like, and I did not like it. And then ever since 2017, I've been I've been hooked. And you just um, answered my question. I was thinking, I said, this has to be after 9-11. I'm, I'm looking at the generation you might be in. Unlike myself, I've been hanging around decades and decades on the earth. But, you know, I'm saying, OK, so the banks change. They want to know who you are, where you are, why you do what you're doing. And uh, why are you doing it here? So I understand the trauma, but it wasn't always yeah. like that. I, I'm not I'm not going to see pros or cons, but it wasn't always like that. But we'll leave it there. So once you get into the bank situation, you have the trauma and everything, I assume, worked out and you got to where you wanted to go and did what you wanted to do. How did you end up really focusing on the crypto piece. I'm really interested in your life and, and the good, the bad, the ugly of crypto. What can our listeners learn and what can you share for why it's been such a good ride for you? It's been a good ride because in in part, the community in crypto is nothing but dreamers, you know, and my life has been enriched with the community of the industry. So I'll I'll say that there. I love the conversations I hear. I love the interactions I get online. They're more authentic and real and deep than I would normally have because we all are believing in something bigger than ourselves. It sounds a little existential, but 
it really does matter. You you walk up to someone that identifies as a Bitcoin maxi and tell them Bitcoin's trash. See how passionate they get, right? <laughs> I am a passionate person. I have a lot of energy and it's nice to be surrounded by those people. So in part, that's what's kept me here. But on, on top of that, I have 10 years of software development experience and like the technology is super dope. Like, it's just cool. Um, I'm a lot younger. I'm 28. I started building PCs and teaching myself how to code and everything towards the later part of high school and going into college. That's when I started my company and everything else. I've always just been kind of gifted with tech. This has been my thing. Um, I just love the differences. I, I just love different ideas. It's outside of the box. Decentralizing everything on a fundamental level has forced really creative, intelligent people to build solutions that are just out of this world in my mind you know I'm, I'm kind of a nerd but just the the application of zero knowledge proofs and how we're scaling ethereum as a collective group of strangers all being incentivized by ether to build this virtual machine that we all support that could do incredible things it's just it's like a, a whole movement of volunteers for profit and i kind of as a libertarian and 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 a enthusiast, I, I'm all about it. So there's a lot there's a lot there for me. And on top of that, you can make a lot of money if you understand it, right? So I won't I won't leave that out. But I like pie charts. So let's say that's that's like thirty percent, maybe forty percent. The rest <laughs> is is genuine interest in the people and things that I get to work with. And who I get to work with every day, like someone like you, for example. Yeah, because we had a good I conversation. Mean, we should have been recording before we started. Uh, well, we started chatting away, but we might get back to that. But I want to back up a little bit with what you just said. You had mentioned okay. something about the solutions. Now, I followed what you just said because I know a little bit about the blockchain, Web3 environment and everything else. But not all of our listeners do. The Pivoting to Web3 podcast was really established for regular folks to understand what's happening, why they need to pay attention and how to embrace their business with all oh. the new technology. And you mentioned that you like what's going on, you know, and all the solutions and how we do this as a community. And it's really kind of like still kind of pie in the sky and there's no specifics. So if we bring it down just a little bit, what are some of the solutions that you really think has been great that you're passionate about? Well, um, I would say one of the, one of the that's a good question. A lot's going through my mind. So the, <laughs> the first thing I think would be cool is if. You unfortunately are listening and you live in a in a country where your fiat currency is being inflated by 20% a month. And let's say you get 10,000 a week of your currency, but the, the following month it's 15,000, right? Let's say you're in that situation. You can park your money in an asset while, you know, like Bitcoin, for example, that is really secure. You could literally take that money put it into Bitcoin, and you would have more money than on average, you would have per month, you would have more money put away than you would have earned at your job. So it gives third world countries or countries that are, are that that's one invention where it is dramatically changing their life. If you go look at the adoption of this technology in those countries, it's immensely helpful. If you're a citizen of Ukraine, your bank failed, like your entire banking system had failed. And you could, if you got your money out of your bank, you were able to put it into Bitcoin, take it on chain, and then you were able to do whatever you needed to get out of that country. If you're in America and you just, you know, we get into war and you're at risk of losing something very important to you and our currency inflates to no one, you know, to, to the moon, just like other currencies are doing. You have an option now. If we were to rewind time 40 years ago, you would have zero options. So Bitcoin, because I feel like that's the most popular one, mm -hmm. um, okay. provides mm -hmm. that that option to us. If it, it and it, it's it's you can think of it as a rainy day fund for humanity in that sense. Um, so yeah, Bitcoin, just just in general for the for the listener. The the solutions being being built that I, I think are really exciting, really are, is going to be like the 721 token standard. I know everyone makes fun of NFTs because they they were hype and there's a lot of social content about them and celebrities are buying them. 
The thing that makes an NFT is a different kind of token. It's a 721 token. The tokens you guys might have heard of, like Bitcoin and Ether and Sol, those are all 20s. Those are ERC, SRC, BTC, 20 tokens. It's a specific thing. You could think of a token standard like a file type, mm -hmm. right? Dot .doc is a, is a file type of a word, and word is the application. So in that sense, <clears throat> we have the ability to provide digital property rights to people. It doesn't sound that important right now, but cancel culture is more relevant today than it was 10 years ago. It might not even been a thought back then. And ownership of your, like, let's say you, you get a massive following, and this podcast does as well. That's your intellectual property. But let's say Buzzsprout or wherever you distribute it doesn't like you, and they don't like what you're talking about, or you go a little too off edge. They could turn it all off. Uh, if you tweeted something um, that was against terms of service, you could lose a million followers in a day, where with 721 tokens, if if your profile, for example, was an NFT, and all of your followers were other NFTs, you could port your entire following into any wallet compatible social media account, and you would own your entire following regardless of where you built it. It changes the paradigm that we just accept right now. And I love mm -hmm. that. So, uh, you know, I look at it from the fundamentals. I'm a fundamentals right. guy. So I break it down all the way into like the zero to one moment, you know, transitioning so from files to tokens and the different kinds of tokens and their standards and how they work. So with the crypto and the tokens, and then you bring in the NFTs. Most NFTs are running on a smart contract, right? What do you think about yep. those? What do we need to learn or understand about smart contracts that you've experienced in your world? Is there are there any gems or um, warnings or concerns? So smart contracts, you could think of them as like... Um, the, the best example is going to be a vending machine. That's probably, I know that sounds a little crazy, but that's probably the first uh, use case of an, F, an NFT idea, um, if you will, or a smart contract, if you will. When you put your money in, because it's, it's two one-way transactions, when you put the money in, you're agreeing that you're only going to put your money into this vending machine and you're only going to buy the products its machine has. You could think of that as almost like Ethereum, right? When you deposit your money, you're going to buy Ether. And then you're going to use whatever is on the Ethereum blockchain. Mm -hmm. And then you type in what you want. And that's all you need to do. You just need to tell it, I'm going to buy CeeLo or I'm going to get the chips. When you do that, a smart contract could execute or a little computer in the machine just starts doing beep, pop, beep, pop till it finds the chips, spits it out. And you have full trust and faith that that vending machine is going to select the right product. And then mm -hmm. you'll actually be able to the same thing with a smart contract. When you say I'm going to transfer my ether into CeeLo's new layer two to get some cool yield, right? That is like you typing E4. And then it's just going to automatically fulfill all of the execution logic that's required to do all of that stuff to give you the end result you'd like. You never really question what that machine's doing, the mechanical arm moving and grabbing the chips. You just accept that I put in a dollar, I type in E4, I get chips. It's the same thing. Smart contracts can break down very complex logic into very simple business statements. And it makes things very easy to one program, but to understand and use. Um, in so addition, more, they, so it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would say they're more, they're more composable too. So it really depends on the smart contracts, some are allowed to be, you know, modified very simply. So you could really get one off the shelf and then, you know, make it very useful to you and your app or whatever you're building. I didn't know you could modify them once they were set. I thought once you set it up, if then, when, or if this happens, the end result. I didn't know once you ended it, you could change it. So there are different kinds of tokens. Not a lot of people know about all the token standards. That's why I'm so, asking you this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So there are different token standards. There are semi-fungible tokens. Those are 1158s. Um, 
in those scenarios, you could have programmable tokens that uh, are also immutable. You can basically pick and choose where they are immutable to keep them secure, but also composable. So which ones would be used in real estate or mortgages and, and yeah. selling? Yeah. Transferring value. Which ones do you think are best? So for the, those would be two different kinds of tokens for the different use cases. I, I would recommend fungible tokens for real estate because like if I was syndicating a deal, if I was trying to get money together, I would want, let's say it's a $10 million apartment in total, make the math easy. I know I need 20% down. And that basically all of a sudden becomes a very simple tokenomics problem. You get 10 mm -hmm. million tokens, let's say, a dollar a token. And then you could sell a token for a dollar on a marketplace until you raise 2 million to get the $10 million apartment. And then you basically have tokens minting and burning as the equity goes up. So if next year it's 10.4, you're going to have to mint more tokens to right or burn mm -hmm. more tokens. That way, the equity can be distributed to all of the token holders that participated in that syndication, right? And the amount of debt you have on the property would also affect this ebb and flow based around the appraisals and the refinancing and whatever else, because that debt and equity number is always going to be changing in real estate. Uh, additionally, if you wanted to be paid rent through this function, if you did this all on chain to begin with, Mm -hmm. um, you're going to want to be paid rent in that token, right? Because you've you've already done the deal. So you're going to need to have, you know, 328 Way Street tokens to pay your investors. That would be, they would be ERC. If in today's world, they're, it's going to be on Ethereum, it's going to be an ERC 20, you know, fungible token. So they're just going to give you a token you can swap to Ether at any point, right? Um, for the rent. And then if you wanted to transfer, let, let's say you wanted to do a one-off deal, like more, let's let's bring it down to residential people, a deed, all of the tax assessments, the insurance. I mean, there's probably 90, 100 documents that gets managed through DocuSign. Right. I would basically turn that entire real estate transaction into smart contracts that you can click and drop and agree to and just have all the transactional details be exchanged all the insurance companies titles be they're all you can automate all of that and i would use a, a 721 for that one you could you could make very easily you know out of the box solutions that's like yeah the house is less than 300,000 this is their credit fill out the form and then it knows that it's going to go grab this smart contract and then what we're going to do is go to the seller. We already know the terms that they would agree to, right? So then it's just about finding the right contract to execute the deal. And you could buy a house digitally in a day doing that, probably, or less. And then so, at the end of the day, when that piece is done, it cannot be changed, right? Yeah, until there's a new owner, you have to resell it and yeah. there have to be another transaction. It, it's mm -hmm. a one-way transaction in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know what keeps you up at night? Anything that really that you worry about or you think about that's like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. Oh, my God. Is there anything like that happening? In the, in the, I mean, everybody's seen NFTs and crypto go through the mud already. But I mean, but everything that you're doing and involved in, it may not be with the crypto, but in the Web3 space or the AI space, because you, you, you've you had some fabulous contents and co content and co conversations. What is it that you're concerned about that's happening in society now with the Web3 technologies? I guess that's my real question that you see that can be a problem or concerned about. And it may not be anything. Oh, no, there's there's plenty. You, you hit it right on the head. <laughs> it's just <laughs> you know? something about um, you. I could just got to tell and look at you like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, like he don't sleep too good at night. You know, he's thinking about too many things. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, man, you were just smiling too much when I saw your video. Yeah. <laughs> I do like smiling. Life's too short, you know. I we could talk about it later, but I, I almost died last year. So oh, I'm, I'm sorry just blessed. To hear that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm very grateful to be here and I don't ever forget that. There's not a day I forget that, you know. Um it was one of the best too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mean time just different, you know. What after happened? the act. I got hit by a car. Yeah. Mm. He was going 50, 55 driver's side. I wasn't buckled up, saved my life, ironically. Um, and the car was half the size after he hit me. It was a 
huge truck. I was in a little sedan. Wow. I was conscious for half an hour. I was, I wasn't cognitively cleared for five months. I couldn't move my upper body for three months. Like I'm just grateful to be here and able to walk and talk and, you know, uh, and, and my perception of time has changed in the sense that it feels more profound, I guess Mm -hmm. it just matters more to me. So you take Um, life more seriously? Would no, you? I take it. I take it less seriously, actually. Okay, because you had a lot I've, of smiles. I've surrendered to life. Okay, I've surrendered to whatever happens to me, good or bad. Whatever comes out of my mouth, whatever, it, literally anything that happens to me, it's good or bad either way. Like if it's bad, it's for me. I'm going to grow from it, and if it's good. It was because that's how it's supposed to be. Like mm. I, I, I just, I've surrendered to the idea that I have control over the, I guess the, the arc of my story. I know how it'll end, and I know it began. But you know, I've surrendered to the ups and downs, the lefts and rights, the strategies. The goal's still there. It's just I'm very loose now, and 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 I'm more present because of that. I don't live in the future or past nearly as much because of it so yeah, being present and staying yeah, present being- was very difficult for me in the past it took some focus and training and really some um awareness to become more present so yeah. um i think we were talking about and i didn't mean to bring you back to yeah. that no, but I'm you're glad good. we talked about it and it's okay and i'm glad you're fine and and it's yeah uh, brought you to a better place in space, um, it seems. It certainly has. Um, to answer your question, though, I, I, I there, there are two big ones. I, the first one, it's going to be CBDCs, like central bank digital currencies. I don't think people understand how powerful they can be. That really concerns me. And then on the macro side, I'm very concerned about the state of fiat currencies in 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 general and the banking situation in America at large. Like I'm just in general very worried about the macroeconomic climate and the government's you know use of blockchain. It can be very parasitic and, and scary. You want to explain that further? Leave it alone. We can explain it further. I didn't know if you wanted more detail. So um, well, I don't I, think I, everybody's going to understand the verbiage that you used. And I try to yeah. keep the broadcast and the okay. podcast at a yeah. point where people still learn. It's more educational got conversation, okay. but education. But I still got to stay away from certain topics. So um, central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. I'm just going to assume that your audience doesn't know what they are or anything else. Right. They, yeah, I prefer that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So basically what that is, is it's the government's blockchain. You have to understand that the a blockchain first is just the infrastructure of the, you could think of it, uh, of, of an internet protocol. Like The way you send an email, you don't even think about it, but there's a protocol called SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. That is what's actually being used to send your Mm -hmm. email from a server to another server. And then there's, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, IMAP, POP3. There's all these different protocols that have been built to facilitate the communication of these systems, right? So with CBDCs, you have to understand that it is just a different form of internet protocol. The internet's not going away. Your money, fiat, US dollar, how you get paid, none of that is changing. This is a infrastructural change to how messages are sent to and from systems and specifically what is sent. So when the government builds their own blockchain, they're going to be able to mint their own token. That is a product of blockchain at large. Mm -hmm. Blockchains cannot you know, they cannot function. They, the actual term blockchain, those things cannot function. DLTs can. That's a different thing. We could get into that later. But blockchains cannot function without a token. It is a byproduct of the network. That's how they incentivize 
validator nodes and all this other stuff. So they they will have a token and that token is going to be the US dollar. Very soon, by 2030 if not sooner, all of those, you know, dollars you have in your bank account are going to be flipped to digital dollars. And I don't know what they'll call it or what the symbol mm. will be. They may not okay. even signify. It. Right. But they're going to become tokens on the government's blockchain. They're not going to be the ones and zeros that are messages sitting on a server owned by the bank that were put there by the central bank. Like it's going to change to be to okay. nodes and tokens. So our tokens are going to be programmable. You could encode in real time at, at any time. It's a it's going to be private and permissioned. It's not going to be permissionless in, in public like Bitcoin right. or Ethereum, mm -hmm. right? They are going to control all users, all permissions, and all rules. And the tokens that you'll be using, again, this is how you get paid for work. This is how you buy your groceries. It's just going to be the same systems. They're going to still use Swift, but they're going to be doing a lot of converting into tokens. And there's just going to be a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that you'll never understand. But things are going to be dramatically different. When you, mm -hmm. when you spend these tokens at the groceries, it's going to log all the SKUs you spent. So SKUs are identifying codes for products in grocery stores. It's going to know you bought your fifth case of eggs, your fourth pack of cigarettes, your third. You get it. Mm -hmm. They can program that money now, not only to record that, send it back and store it and associate it to your wallet that they're going to give you. They also can say they're 40 pounds overweight. And this is the fifth time they've went to uh, Putters. It's a local restaurant around me. We're simply just not going to allow them to pay. Like they could disable your funds. Uh, okay, uh, go ahead, keep talking. Yeah, they could disable your funds. What what they could also do, and 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 if you guys are at home listening, Google Shenzhen trial of China. This is not a conspiracy theory. They're very public. There's also another website you could go to, cbdctracker.org. That site is going to give you every country's progress on their own blockchain from 2013 to now. Okay. So okay. it's all public. Every research document, everyone that's involved in it, it's public information thanks to the Freedom Information Act. Shout out to Edward Snowden. Appreciate you. Um, it is completely public. So now... What they've done in China is they said at the end of the month, we're going to burn 10% of your net income if you don't spend it to stimulate economic growth. They tried this in the Shenzhen trials, right? You get a Shenzhen trial. Mm -hmm. um, they also stood up a social credit score. I'm sure we've heard about all that. That's on a blockchain. So your their face ID is algorithmically programmed to be a unique ID. That's how you unlock your phone, right? That unique ID is tied to their uh, Chinese-issued wallet. And then that wallet has everything they ever need. That's how they get paid. That's the tokens, the digital yuan. That's how they get paid. And then they've programmed for a month that the last 10% is going to be taken out if they didn't go spend it to stimulate economic growth. Or... That face ID tied to that wallet walks across the street jaywalking. Their closed caption television system, CCTV, captures it, identifies the face. It'll automatically burn their tokens, their digital yuan, for the fine without due process or anything else. Because they have evidence and they can empirically prove it thanks to blockchain. They can mint these tokens and burn them without your consent thanks to blockchain. There is another side of blockchain that no one seems to care or talk about. That is unfolding, and it concerns me greatly. I don't know if the United States of America will ever let it get that bad, right? But my issue is they'll have the option to get that bad, and I don't trust them at all personally. Um, so, so, so that, that's, that, <clears throat> that concerns I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's just, just, just. I'm good. It just concerns me. So that's some yeah. of the conversation and dialogue that I hear that on the blockchain side, you got good and bad actors. And that's some, that's where that conversation comes from when people always say, oh, well, there's bad actors everywhere. But that's something to be concerned about. Um, 
So thank you for the insight in that. On the flip side, what's your wish list? Oh, oh. The <laughs> most bullish thing about blockchain to ever happen is just going to be learning about blockchain. My the my wish list would be whoever exists that knows the word Bitcoin just got downloaded 10% of what I knew. And then I would be I'd be the happiest man in the world. Bitcoin would be worth 10 million bucks. Ether would be at 50K. Chainlink, XRP. There's going to be so many. I mean, the whole industry could be two to 300 trillion when we're all said and done. Um, I, 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 I would wish that everyone understood that blockchain is not like this scammy crypto bro, like whatever, or these super top dog researcher and analysts, right? I, I want people to understand like this is this is like the combustion engine. Blockchain or Bitcoin was built to solve one problem. The problem, the second issue I referenced, right? Fiat collapsing, right? That 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 was why Bitcoin was built after 07. The combustion engine was built to solve horses pulling carts and crapping all over the road and it's just miserable, right? What if we could put more more than two horses on a cart? No one ever thought that the combustion engine would be used in a microwave, right? Mm -hmm. And it would be used in a lawnmower, in a weed whacker. In, I mean, the list goes on. Yeah. In the in the windows of your car, like literally combustion engines everywhere, uh, planes, so many industries, trillions and trillions and tens of trillions of dollars around one simple idea, the combustion engine, right? Blockchain is that way. It solved that problem with Bitcoin, but its use cases are endless. They're endless. There are things that have not even been thought of yet that are going to radically change our lives using blockchain as an idea. The idea of distributed computing and pooled resources. And there, there's so many core fundamentals that are rooted in crypto science. No, I'm sorry, computer science. Too much crypto on my mind. Computer <laughs> science, the fundamentals that have that have given us the life we have now, regardless of your opinion on it, life is a lot easier. I can go on my phone and click two buttons and get food delivered to me. Mm -hmm. Like, right. So life is much simpler. Our even the poorest of poorest people in America live better than 70 something percent of the world. So we have nothing to to scoff at at the idea that blockchain could radically improve our lives. It would make our lives that much uh, more convenient. And, and and useful, but in the wrong hands, it, it can be used to, to, you know, own us in a way. So I think I got one I last question. Passionate <clears throat> was me. That's how I ended. I just wish people were more passionate and knew about it. Really. I'm passionate. That's why I got this podcast. <laughs> I want I everybody to know what we need to know and not let it go by. There was a horrible experience with Intel once I realized how big it was going to be. So let me ask you this, because this might be helpful and you're in that crypto space. People get approached different times. Is there a way to tell, are there some obvious clues and cues that should give somebody a heads up that you're about to get in a scam? Or um, oh yeah, you know, I'm sure somebody like you would know, like, look, you need to at least look here for this, 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 and this. Or don't take forever yeah. to develop the blockchain. Uh, are, are there just certain things? that people should look up for. I think our listeners would appreciate that. Yeah, of course. So step one, you're always going to want to read the URL. I don't care where you're at, what you're doing. If you're on your, um, you know, I, I'm forgetting Safari on your phone or your, your mm -hmm. desktop or on Google Chrome, Linux, it does not matter. I don't care yeah. what software you have installed. The only way that you can lose your crypto is if you give someone your keys. The, the problem with that statement is you will you may not know you're doing it. You, I'm not saying intentionally give them your keys. You're, you talking, about, also, you're talking about your, you got the public and your private key. So you know correct. not to give your private key to anybody. Can they do something That's with the public key? They cannot do anything with the public key. Okay. But what they can do is, and this is this is where I was getting to, what they can do, let's say you're trying to do like, I don't know, fridebunny.com, 
let's just say that's like a NFT site that you're about to get. And it's like a cartoon thing. But the I is a capital L instead. And then they've copied and pasted every line of code. It does not look any different. It, it functions the same, everything else. You connect your wallet and it's done. You think you're minting an NFT and in fact, they've cleaned out your wallet. Mm-hmm. Right? You didn't know you were on the wrong URL because you didn't read it. You need to read every single URL that you ever engage in when you're in crypto um, until there are really important and relevant, you know, things that have been built to protect you. So for now, always, 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 always check the uh, the URL. Never click a link that you don't know. Every link you click, you should be reading the URL. I could beat a dead horse on that. You need to be reading the URLs. If it does not make sense, then it isn't, it is not sensical. Mm-hmm. And it's that simple. If you read a title from an email and it's like, huh? If you yeah, have no, any. I've gotten a lot of those. Right. Yeah. You're just like, what? I don't it, touch them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't even, don't even look at it. You know, flag is spam. Report phishing. It Can doesn't matter. It? If it's Can't you just delete it? Delete it. Do whatever you want. Just don't touch a link. Okay. What pe- what they're doing is they're sending you a link, hoping you'll touch it, and hopefully it'll be innocuous. Like it, it won't be anything. But what you've actually done is executed um, basically a worm file that's going to download a keylogger. Whenever you use that thing, whenever you type into your keyboard, they will know. And when they see 16, 12, 24, whatever uniquely specific, right? That's your private key. As soon as they see it, you're done. Oh, wow. Mark Cuban fell into that. Like just recently, even Vitalik Buterin, he fell into that. So, and he's the founder of Ethereum, for those who don't know. Like he he has been scammed. So is Mark Cuban, very smart guy. Like it's just these things. Um, and then also, if you're a little bit more of an intermediate, uh, this is just your reminder, always validate the last eight digits of your wallet, sending and receiving before you send something. And mm-hmm. always send the token in a small, small, small amount first to make sure the funds are received, the interface updates, and you did not make a mistake because you very easily could. could those, be, those would be my tips. Could it be a QR code too? Like you get, a, you get an email with a strange QR code? Instead of the link, yeah. they want you to use the QR code. Now That's you won't install a keylogger. Yeah, you won't install a keylogger <clears throat> scanning it. Um, but when you click to open it on your phone, you could. I'm not as familiar with how secure phones are. I've been out of the software development space for phone mm-hmm. apps since 20. 20- 2016 2017 so i'm not i wouldn't i don't want to consider myself an expert there but okay um yeah i just wouldn't if you don't know what it is don't don't definitely don't be point your camera at it <laughs> i don't recommend that. i didn't that was the first time i got a qr code with something strange and i just looked at it yeah i just wanted to I mean, do that's... delete and then somebody else got one now i think it's something new that they're using is the qr code so let me let me ask you this how do we reach you? How does the audience connect with you, reach you? What do you want to share? If you guys want to hear anything similar to what you've heard on this show, uh, JT knows things. I post roughly 30 times a week um, with nothing but content that I try to help explain the, the principles of this stuff. And from there, if you ever want to you know, engage with me, work or otherwise, my link tree will take you to all of my companies and everything I'm working on, including the fund, where a lot of this research and knowledge and all the things I know uh, impacts my, my day-to-day in my life. So JT knows things, any platform, I'm out there. JT, you know a lot of things. And I'm so sure glad that you're here on Pivoting. To Web3 Podcast, this is Donna Mitchell and JT, who knows a lot of things. So check out his link tree. And I thank you. I plan to have you back. I hope you want to come back. And good evening and have a nice day, everybody. And thank you for checking us out on Pivoting to Web3 Podcast. Thanks for listening to Pivoting to Web3 at pivotingtoweb3.com. 
Make sure you hit the subscribe button so that it gets to you with every episode that comes out. We have lots of great opportunities, limitations, and downward spirals being revealed by our guests. And thank you in advance for all your reviews and comments. I appreciate you so much. I look forward to serving you in the next week's episode.